Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan. I welcome you to the TRT World Forum Digital Debates. Today we are going to look at 10-year-old conflict in Syria and its impact on the domestic issues as well as on the neighboring and uh, more global, I think, implications of the case. I have got two uh, guests today. I would like to welcome them. Now, let me introduce uh, them to you. The first one is uh, uh, Salman Sheikh. Welcome to our program, Salman. Salman is the uh, founder and CEO of the Sheikh Group. Before he started his uh, initiative, he was the director of the Brookings Institute's Doha Center, where his research focused on conflict resolution, domestic policy, and geopolitics of the Middle East. Sheikh has an ex extensive experience uh, working with the United Nations as a special assistant and political advisor in various offices. He was also uh, as the director for policy and research in the private office of Her Highness Sheikha Moza bin Nasser al Misnet, the consort of the former Emir of the state of Qatar. And he was uh, 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 commenting on many uh, places like uh, Al Jazeera, NBC, CNN, and BBC. He is well known in the uh, affairs of the Middle East. My second guest is Ammar Khaf. Uh, he is the executive director of Omran Center for Strategic Studies and member of the Syrian Forum. Dr. Ammar uh, is uh, based in Istanbul and this think tank works on the Syrian affairs. He is also a founding member of the Syrian Forum Consortium and he completed his PhD in political science and Islamic studies from the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, his dissertation research actually was titled as Syrian Authoritarianism, Persistence or Change. He focused on the geopolitics of the uh, Middle East. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to uh, join me today. Let me begin with um, Sheikh uh, Salman. Uh, Salman, um, no, we have seen a number of, I think, uprisings in the region. Of course, uh, we have seen in the 1980s in Syria, and now in 2000s, uh, we have seen yet another one, but this is, I think, more uh, uh, bloody than the first one, probably. Uh, please, can you explain to us uh, the similarities and differences between the two revolutions uh, in the Syrian context? Well, thank you. Thank you. Let me just start by saying, Dr. Talib, how, how lovely it is to be uh, back on this uh, TRT World Forum and also to join my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Amar. Um, at this point in time. Um, I think the, the the similarities and differences, first of all, the differences, I, I think there are many. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, in the 1980s, it was largely spearheaded by a political party, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, whereas the one more recently, starting in 2011, uh, was, was very much a popular uh, uh, movement as such. Another difference was that it, it, very quickly in the 1980s it became a more of an armed struggle whereas i i would say that uh, more recently it was very much starting as a peaceful uh, movement which uh, spread across the country and included uh, a, a larger i think uh, sectors and components of the population um, uh, there was also i think a more specific political agenda in the in the 1980s uh, espoused by the political party uh, whereas in terms of the political objectives and goals i think the, more recently those were initially more secondary to people simply wanting more dignity and more freedom and their lives to be improved uh, than had been the case under so many years of uh, both Ba'ath party and assad rule and incidentally Today, I believe, is the anniversary of the of the Ba'ath Party, um, as well. Uh, those are some of the quickly some of the of the major differences. I, the main similarity, of course, is the way that the regime has reacted. So both father and son have reacted in a very brutal way, um, with the excessive use of force uh, in terms of uh, visiting collective punishment um, <coughs> on the large quantities uh, of, of the people and politically not really showing any commitment to negotiate and negotiate in good faith um, at the political uh, level. Um, there is, in terms of the excessive use of force more recently, I must say I should draw attention to not particularly the use of chemical weapons. 
uh, by Bashar al-Assad um, and the regime. Um, if you go on the uh, internet, if you can't remember yourself, and of course Syrians have lived through every single one of them, unfortunately there is a long list of, of, uh, uh, of incidences, of places, uh, of cities and towns where the Assad regime has used chemical weapons, um, uh, which, has, which did lead in 2013 and 14 to the international community to investigate this. But the, the big mistake that was made was to pronounce that uh, those weapons had been taken out. Um, so that's just been another sort of uh, use. And in many ways, from the, two th from, uh, the 1980s to 2010 to 20, we've seen, as you've said in your question, a further brutalization of the use of war tactics against the Syrian uh, people, which should tell us that Aleppo doesn't change its spots. Uh, this regime, uh, uh, whether under father and son, has uh, employed similar methods, but that this has got more and more egregious, more and more bloody. Um, and it, if uh, I think the situation continues, uh, I'm afraid that uh, the, the future would be more of the same. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very useful, I think, contextualization of the uh, events that are still unfolding in, in Syria. You have just mentioned the use of chemical weapons uh, and the international community was supposed to be very actively reacting. And on a number of times, the US administration declared it as a red line, but it was crossed. And uh, I think the US remained silent on that. And that will bring me to uh, the question of the role of international community, uh, Ammar. You know, in the beginning of the, uh, I think, uh, uprising, there was support by the international community, by the Western powers, especially to the opposition groups, and they were actively supporting. But later on, it waned, and then it became uh, not an agenda for the for the Western uh, or European powers in terms of military support to the opposition. Why do you think that happened, first of all? Secondly, do you think that there is any hope that the opposition might be supported by the U.S. You know, new administration or by the EU or by other international, uh, let's say, uh, a, a, a coordination uh, to uh, empower the opposition groups in, in Syria? Or that is that end. Well, I mean, thank you very much again for hosting uh, this wonderful discussion and uh, pleasure to be with Salman also uh, uh, this evening. Uh, I mean, this is a very complex question, obviously. It's a, it's a million dollar question of why the international community uh, sold out. I think that each of the community, just like any country, they uh, entered into the race of supporting uh, the uh, revolution or the uprising for different reasons. And, and those different reasons uh, transpired and transformed into new uh, dimensions throughout the process. Uh, we had several phases of the uprising uh, in which also the regime played a lot of, and its backers uh, played a very consistent role in uh, deviating the uh, narrative of the uprising to become a war on terror. Uh, and perhaps that's one of the, maybe not the first, but one of the main uh, uh, problematic turns, uh, which which was a U-turn of uh, the uprising uh, timeline, uh, is is when the war was reframed as the war on on terror, and not uh, tackling the cause of terror of and and the the, the regime that let out uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, terrorists uh, out of the of, of the prisons to continuously and persistently uh, perceive this as, as a war on, uh, on terrorism and that this is just another attempt by you know, the international community to get out at uh, an Arab regime and, and uh, export democracy and all that uh, uh, talk. And, and so that was one of the areas. And, and this is where uh, obviously the countries disagree on the definition of terrorism and each country uh, you have countries that perceive political Islam as the sole and only terrorist group in the world, and others perceive uh, other groups uh, as also equally as the only terrorist group. And, and so they only focused on, on one entity and uh, started, you know, the military aid and the support to the opposition also started to, um, to, be, to be let out into different avenues. Uh, 
Now, I'm not going to say that the opposition was not a player on this, uh, or perhaps the, the lack of a consistent initiative by the opposition, but I think that was the weaker point in that sense. Uh, the more It was more of an internationalized, quickly uh, becoming uh, from a social movement, uh, a very grassroots uh, movement against the regime to be uh, immediately turned into uh, you know, the UN, the first UN, the, the UN Geneva in 2012, rename, reframing uh, the uprising as becoming a conflict between a government and an opposition group. Uh, and so that reframe is very typical and it's very standard in the international, uh, you know, mediation system. Uh, but, but the regime was able to, again, use that the moment, uh, you know, the Russians went out of that room in uh, 2012. Uh, they said, here, we got it. We uh, secured uh, the Assad regime in office for, for, you know, for another term or so. Uh, while the Americans went out and said, uh, you know, we, we secured the, uh, the outcast, you know, to out uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad. And so that, that reframing and reframing and reframing obviously uh, really took the, uh, internationalized the file, first of all. And so it went out of the uh, hands of both uh, the opposition and the regime and became of a, a, an international crisis, unfortunately. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I think Syria became a subfile of the Iranian uh, JCPOA, for example, and then a subfile of a subfile of the, of the regional uh, order. Uh, and so you have uh, Gulf, Gulf co conflicts, you have uh, also conflicts against uh, Turkey from different countries here and there. Uh, so these bilateral uh, uh, relations basically also influenced how each country defined terrorist groups. Uh, and so this is where it became a war of, of uh, terminologies and, and narratives. Uh, and, and then later on, uh, after the Vienna agreements, also the, the Syria file was also reframed to become a more uh, regional uh, file, meaning each country was given a piece of the pie you know, you have one country that was given the piece to uh, of the pie to redefine what an opposition is. Another country was given the task of defining who is a terrorist and who's not. Uh, and, uh, you know, other countries were set, were limited, such as Turkey, for example, was uh, uh, limited to um, focus more on the borders and border security and PKK uh, and so forth. Uh, and then other countries focused on international aid such as European countries that took a step backwards, uh, except for the, uh, you know, the funding that comes out of them and so forth. And then even you have subcategories within those different categories. So we went from a Friends of Syria uh, of maybe 100 and, and plus countries in Marrakesh in uh, 2012 to the small group of the Syria, Friends of Syria group, which was 11 ministers uh, and then later that stalled, and then uh, you had the you know re, uh, resurgence of a an international Syria support group, and then later into another redefined, and then now we have the Astana group and the small Syria group of uh, of, of the five plus two countries, um, and and even now there's also parallel tracks being uh, built in terms of a mechanism of. Uh, what's called as a mechanism of Qatar and and, uh, and Russia and Turkey. So you have these also parallel tracks uh, ongoing. All of that, I think, uh, caused, uh, led uh, Syria, or among other reasons, obviously, uh, to become not a very vital, not a very important uh, file on the policymakers in uh, many major countries. And, and you have uh, Ukraine now on the table. You have issues that are much, uh, you know, the Mediterranean uh, gas uh, conflicts and so forth. You have Libya, Azerbaijan, you have Yemen, you have other issues that are also all interconnected at the end of the day, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Syria has, has kept going down and down. I mean, another turning point was the JCPOA, which which I think is very relevant to today because discussions are very are ongoing as of yesterday. In okay, terms we, of, will, uh, you know, Omar, we will, yeah, we will come to the role of regional actors in more detail in the uh, maybe other sections of our uh, debate. Now, I would like to turn to Bashar with the same question, to some extent, uh, what he expects from the Biden administration with regard to Syria, whether the administration will rethink its uh, policy over Syrian issues. Secondly, of course, uh, I mean, when we look at the reality on the ground, Bashar al-Assad is there and he doesn't want to go. He's not willing to go because 
uh, you know, after the support of uh, Russia and then Iran, he is consolidating his power, especially in, in uh, around Damascus, at least. So how do you see the future from this angle? And what do you think that the Syrian opposition can do further? What are the main mechanisms that they can make use of? Plus your expectations from the US. Would you like me on that? Dr. Yes, please, Salman. Yeah. Yes, sure. Um, actually, I'll, I'll just touch a little bit, go back a little bit on the, just the previous question to go on this Bashar uh, question. Um, I, I think a, a lot of what Amar said is absolutely correct. Uh, the thing about the international community's response was that uh, when it became a, an armed conflict, uh, the international community first outsourced some of that support to sort of key regional countries, which frankly was a recipe for uh, fragmentation in terms of the response. And I saw that sitting in the Gulf uh, myself when I was heading uh, Brookings. Um, then we started to see that actually there was probably a decision made along the lines uh, as the thing uh, as the situation was quite uncontrolled that uh, the regime shouldn't necessarily fall but it should be pressured into serious negotiations but that was blown out of the water because the regime had no intention of bashar had no intention of negotiating and lo and behold by 2015 uh, the, uh, the the bluff was caught <laughs> with the with the response of Russia um, and Iran. So we had then a, a, a policy which w was neither going forward or or willing to 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 reappraise what had happened um, in the past um, as such. And this brings me then to the international community's uh, response. I think from 2015 onwards. And I recall being in Moscow and being told by a senior uh, Russian official at the time, uh, the president has received some uh, uh, advice. So uh, uh, basically, there's a few weeks and either he gets more support or Bashar falls. Um, and he got more support. Uh, and the rest of the international community was not able then really to be um, in the game. Um, instead, uh, what we had was a situation where I, I, I don't say this lightly because I, I, we work closely with uh, colleagues. Uh, I myself am, am British, but I must say that it, in the West then, I think, followed a colossal moral and legal failure. Um, one which uh, the reverberations that go way beyond Syria, where the international community as a whole was not willing to stand up to the egregious and persistent breaches of international law, of grave violations of human rights, which now constitute, uh, we all know, war crimes and crimes against humanity. That was the beginning of the end of the rules-based international order, which we, when I was growing up, especially at the end of the Cold War, started, took for granted as being something which would help uh, 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 administer how states uh, dealt with each other. Um, and that is what we have been seeing in decline, I would say, over the past decade or so. Now, Bashar, he is a very lucky man because he, on his watch, we've seen this uh, uh, un unravel. But the, the, the bad news for those who think that the regime has won is that, of course, it has not. Uh, we're now in another phase. But the tragedy here for Syrians is that for the foreseeable future, we are seeing a fragmented Syria. We are seeing a Syria whereby which uh, uh, I would say the vast majority of Syrians will not readily accept the rule of Bashar al-Assad. But we also see an international community which is uh, indifferent or cannot find the keys in which to, to, to move uh, forward. And this despite whatever efforts that there are by uh, countries to, to find ways to normalize uh, with Bashar al-Assad. I believe uh, the, the European Union, the United States, for example, will maintain a position of not dealing with Bashar. And in fact, the sanctions regime, which came in in 2011, particularly by these two blocs, I think has only uh, strengthened over a period of, of time. Um, I think there has to be a plan B. And uh, the plan B, is first and foremost for those areas which are not under the regime's control, 
there has to be a set of interim, and I stress interim arrangements, which provide better governance, well-being and support to the millions of Syrians that are there, uh, particularly with regards to Northwest Syria and also with regards to Northeast Syria. Uh, uh, we can come to Northeast Syria perhaps a, a little bit later on, but there has to be a, a greater uh, effort to find connectivity there and for hopefully a better set of examples to contribute to the overall political process as well uh, uh, going forward. Um, secondly, there has to be a continued effort when it comes to accountability. You cannot commit the kinds of crimes that have been committed by Syria with impunity. And we see what has happened in German courts, for example, and where there are efforts by Syrian groups, by Syrian civil society, as well as the international community, even states, uh, uh, which have supported that. So whether it's the IIIM at the UN or whether it's these uh, specific uh, private or state-led efforts, I think that has to uh, continue. And finally, um, I, I would say there has to be a serious look at the humanitarian system. And here I refer also to those who happen to be in regime-held areas. Undoubtedly, we have seen a diminution, a diminishing of, of, of uh, the living standards of, of Syrians uh, uh, that are in regime-held areas. Of course, COVID has affected everybody around the world and not least in Syria. But the bread queues that we see and things like that, despite the billions of dollars of humanitarian aid that has been poured in, now, there has to be a humanitarian audit as to what is the marginal, what is the effect of all that aid when it comes to uh, Syrian civilians, particularly in regime held areas. And we all know, and I've heard it, I must tell you, directly, privately from UN humanitarian officials who would admit that the actual benefit to Syrian civilians, particularly in regime held areas, has been very marginal. Why is that? That is because the regime controls uh, the aid, and it controls who administers uh, uh, that aid. Now, we have an important date coming up in July of this year, where again, uh, the uh, the UN resolution which regarding cross-border aid will be discussed uh, again. Here, the UN administration, the Biden administration said, has already given some clear signaling that it would want not for that, uh, for those, for that border to be shut, but in fact, for more border crossings to be opened up. And I hope um, that that will be the case. But we certainly need also uh, a wholesale change when it comes to humanitarian delivery. Whilst we search for a political solution, and whilst we search for a, a serious political transition um, in Syria. Well, I think that's a very comprehensive, I think, uh, reply to what I have uh, asked. Now, I just would like to follow on uh, some of the points that you have uh, raised with, with Ammar. Uh, now, when we look at the uh, situation on the ground, there is less fighting, probably, uh, compared to the past. And how tenable is it? Is there a really uh, viable ceasefire on the ground? And to what extent that will really help people to get more aid, as Salman has said, there's a humanitarian aid going there, but whether it is accessible to everyone, or only a you know small section of the population can uh, can uh, have access to the humanitarian aid. Secondly, the movement of people, whether there is a safe movement of people on the ground, because uh, you know, there are areas where there is no fighting at the moment, but also there is a place, Idlib, so we will be talking on Idlib, but let me uh, focus on the humanitarian issues, aid, uh, ceasefire, and also uh, movement of people. How tenable is the situation now? Uh, are we expecting anything that will flare up soon? Well, I mean, the, the question is uh, how terrible it is. And, and that's a very relative, uh, I mean, it's terrible all over. But uh, I can tell you from my visits inside Syria uh, as, as soon as last uh, last week, I mean, the, the situation in, in different areas is, is uh, progressing at different rates. And so uh the, the the humanitarian access is is a serious issue the movement of, of people across the three now we have three because of the frozen conflict and there hasn't been a major uh military operation uh, a grandiose military operation since march of 2020 and thanks to the russian turkish agreement um since then there has been some attacks here and there some skirmishes but nevertheless we have frozen the conflict 
uh, a, a fragmented uh, Syria, as, as Salman says, uh, with at least three, if not four, uh, zones of, com of, of influence. The Northeast being uh, primarily by uh, the uh, the U.S. Uh, military, with some Russian and, and Turkish in different zones in different areas, uh, and then the North and Northwest, uh, primarily by the Turkish military, and the South is also divided between uh, primarily Russian areas like Daraa and and a few others, and uh, then mixed areas between Iran and, and and other forces. So you have three different zones. And so, obviously, I think in terms of humanitarian access, the, the most terrible situation has been uh, is under the regime areas. I mean, those are the areas that, unfortunately, the regime has established numerous number of economic networks uh, that uh, is even more capable of, uh, of, of abusing the, uh, the systems, uh, the UN system and the other systems of humanitarian aid to, to absorb it into its corrupt networks and, and so forth. So... If the regime was corrupt uh, in 2011, and that was the root cause of, or one of the main root causes of the conflict, it's 10 times even more corrupt now. Um, the humanitarian situation in terms of personal freedoms, in terms of arrests, kidnappings, are uh, the highest in regime areas, the highest in Dara, for example, that the Russians claim to have won the victory of, of reconciliation. Um, and this is through our study of, of monitoring those uh, Incidents. Actually, we did a recent study at Omran uh, on, uh, uh, you know, arbitrary detention, on explosives, on assassinations and attacks uh, in all of Syria. And and the number one has been uh, primarily in uh, regime areas, especially Daraa that we looked at. Uh, humanitarian situation in Douma that the regime claimed victory and pushed people out of those cities. Still today, there are neighborhoods in Douma in the suburb of Damascus that people cannot go back into. Those are still called security zones that you need a secular security clearance to go into. Uh, and so uh, the, the access to the humanitarian aid in, in regime areas and add to that the currency devaluation, uh, the, the, the regime, I mean, look at, look at how it, it functions in terms of the currency devaluation. Uh, it's, it's, you know, stopped the, uh, uh, lately last week, uh, a lot of the, um, the workforce, the working hours and the schools and so forth, not because of COVID uh, breakout, but because of there's not, not enough gasoline to get people to work uh, or to schools. Uh, and also to, to kind of do a temporary fix on the, the currency by minimizing the demand on the currency. And so, I mean, these are all the temporary, this, this shows you how desperate the victorious so-called uh, 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 regime in, in Damascus. I mean, now it's, it's very desperate for any economic uh, stimulus that could at least survive it. And this is how the regime has been operating, is surviving from now until probably April, May, uh, next month when they have the elections. Deadline is by June. And so from now until June, they will have somehow elections if it's not postponed. Uh, so they need to promote themselves as, you know what, here's an economic stimulus. We got you some, uh, you know, gasoline or diesel and so forth. That's the, the, the modus operandi. This is how the regime logic has been going through. In terms of the Northeast, the humanitarian situation has deteriorated since the closure of the uh, international cross-border agreement uh, by the Russians. I mean, it, it, there are ways, obviously, to get into, and I agree, I mean, one of the, the scenarios should be perhaps to uh, secure those regions that, that maybe you can have a synchronized or a, some kind of an agreement between the Northeast and the Northwest in terms of, of humanitarian access, at least to alleviate the suffering on uh, uh, average individuals. The problem with the UN system in, in Damascus is that it has become, instead of having leverage, I mean, the regime needs the UN system to bring US dollars into the system. That's one, the, you know, and, and, and the UN, you know, can, can basically decide on in different ways to bargain, to negotiate, uh, to, to, to push a certain uh, way of, you know, let's not get cash into, let's how about get some, uh, you know, support the supply chain rather than support the demand chain and so forth. But none of that has been taking place because the regime, the, 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 the UN system, including its staff uh, in Damascus has been hostage to the regime. Uh, the regime basically doesn't allow them to do anything. And they have basically laid back and uh, not even took a, a step, I believe, in uh, negotiating a better, <laughs> humanitarian access. And now we have, you know, the July renewal, which the Russians have already declared that they want to get Babel Hawa back and 
um, that thinking that that could, uh, you know, bring some dollars into uh, the regime held areas. Um, you know, that that's a very problematic uh, uh, challenge, upcoming challenge for the international community and Syrian people, obviously. Um, that that poses, and, and maybe the Russians are trying to bargain on something else, you know, opening uh, cross-line uh, access of people to move. People can't move today. I mean, technically because of the COVID breakout since the COVID, but now, you know, it's it's not just COVID. It's, there's a policy of restricting people from going to one zone to another, uh, uh, whether, human, you know, civilians or humanitarian and so forth. Uh, and I think that needs to be uh, perhaps revisited, but in an orderly fashion, because again, the regime has been abusing, for example, the Turkish controlled areas in the north uh, west, the safe zone, by pumping uh, Syrian pounds in it and, and pulling out this, the US dollars. I mean, this has been going before the COVID, uh, because since the COVID, most lines have been uh, shut down. Uh, so those types of, 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 of deals have, have destabilized certain areas uh, while not stabilizing the regime held areas, while basically pumping money back into, um, into, into, the, into the regime areas. Well, thank you, uh, Ammar. Thank you very much. Uh, Salman, you talked about the fragmentation. Of, of course, this is very obvious in the Syrian context. Uh, you know, there are some power zones, there are some conflict zones. Uh, it is very clear. Now, uh, how do you see the uh, different entities or factions in this fragmented state, how they can engage with each other? Do you see, for example, realignments like uh, YPG, PKK, STF with the regime? And if that happens, on what basis? What would be the objectives and the mechanism? Sure. Um, I'll talk about the northeast and the northwest, uh, perhaps as, as part of two of those zones of uh, of, uh, of of fragmentation. Um, on the northeast side, um, it's been clear that the the, the PYD and YPG, uh, SDF have been uh, cooperating with the regime. Uh, we've seen that in, in military terms, um, pro-regime and government forces were allowed to stay, for example, in the city centers of Hasaka and Kamishli um, as well. This uh, increased further, in fact, in recent years after a new agreement uh, was reached between the two actors. We've also seen this, the smuggling routes and uh, of, of oil and things like that at an economic level as well. Um, but, I, but I must say to you, as it... Um, uh, has become apparent that the U.S. is not withdrawing from northeast Syria anytime soon. I think uh, the the YPG uh, efforts, uh, the SDF's efforts to get agreement with the regime has for now come to a dead end, and this has been said quite publicly um, as well. Um, and in fact, I think uh, whilst there may be uh, differences of opinion on this, I think this does present some a window of opportunity in which to deepen the dialogue between Syrians, uh, first and foremost within northeast Syria. Uh, we must never forget that the majority of the communities are uh, Arab communities, um, uh, many of whom which were worst affected by uh, ISIS or Daesh and their rule, uh, particularly in places like uh, Raqqa and Deir Ezzor and southern Hasaka and, and uh, all the way down to the, to the southeast. Um, as well, Abu Kamal, and uh, and so what we have uh, right now is a fledgling self-administration. But uh, we also know that it has a challenge. Uh, first, in terms of stability and security of the area, but secondly, in terms of convincing the people. Um, uh, you, you may know that from our own work uh, in the Sheikh Group, we have been uh, at a track two level, been trying to encourage a much more community level. Uh, dialogue and it's absolutely imperative whatever you call it at the end of the day when it comes to northeast syria that uh, there is a, a, a proper representation and uh, governance uh, good governance um, in this particular area um, as such now in our own conversations when it comes to particularly uh, the ypg sdc or sdf whichever set of names uh, you, you you call it um that there is an argument for pushing at least for a clear uh, uh, cessation of uh, any hostilities that the SDF would carry out in Turkish controlled areas, um, whether on the border or on the, on the other side. Uh, I, I believe that has to happen first before we're able to, to, to go uh, 
um, any further. And then, of course, the reforms and the changes uh, when it comes to real governance representation when it comes to these areas. That may well help us travel down a route whereby which you can find some level of further stabilization um, as an interim solution uh, uh, whilst uh, the political process remains frozen. That's regarding the Northeast. On the Northwest of Syria, um, uh, we've also engaged in studies um, uh, as Omran and, and other colleagues have done in particular with regards to how do you bring about better coherent governance uh, when it comes to uh, these particular areas. Of course, uh, these areas have taken on a very heavy burden with regards to the number of internally displaced millions of in internally displaced people. Uh, it requires improving governance arrangements in that. And there, of course, there are clear partnerships which have been established between Turkish uh, municipalities uh, across the border and, uh, and, and local uh, entities, local councils, uh, the Syrian interim government and uh, opposition there. I think it is time that there be a further opening up to Syrian ideas in terms of a more coherent governance then. Um, then uh, to move to uh, how do you provide some level of interconnectivity between the north and the northeast of, of Syria? I believe that is important. And then at the political level, how do you get better representation of the people of the north and the northeast of Syria in the political process? And I think if, if a lot of what I've just been saying is uh, uh, there is progression on this, there is an importance that the Syrian opposition also be brought into a, a, a further discussion. Uh, so both at the practical governance level and at the political level, we start to deal with some of the fragmentation uh, which has taken place. Uh, these are not easy things, and I know they pose a lot of difficulties for the for, for Turkey as a state, particularly the role of the of the PKK um, uh, in both northeast Syria and across, of course, in in Syria itself. But I think my own conversations, at least in Ankara, uh, whilst it's been very clear, uh, have been said to me in terms of uh, the skepticism there is from Ankara when it comes to particularly the role played by the SDF, the YPG, and the PKK within that, um, I have, have still given me uh, the, the sense that we should work on this and we should continue to work on, on improving governance um, arrangements across both the North and the Northeast and better representation politically in the political process uh, which comes from Syrians from these areas. Well, regarding the uh, Northeast uh, part of Syria, now, PYD and YPG, actually, they are hijacking the representation in a sense. Uh, you have already mentioned that there is a, you know Arab majority in the region, but uh, when it comes to PYD and YPG, uh, they represent themselves mostly as uh, Kurdish entities. Uh, how do you think that will uh, be managed? Because, uh, as you said, there is uh, less representation by the Arab uh, majority, uh, quote-unquote. Um, well, it's a, it's a very, it's not a... It's not an entirely stable situation, is it? If we look at the security environment, and especially uh, if we were to see an American withdrawal um, from the area and the support that they provide um, in, in, in security vis-a-vis uh, -vis Daesh as well, uh, we would see probably uh, a resurgence of, of the fighting, which is why it's absolutely imperative that uh, local communities um, uh, are represented they feel that the governance is fair, that resources are distributed uh, more fairly, and that uh, things like corruption and better governance, uh, are, uh, corruption is uh, diminished and better governance uh, results. So whatever, whoever rules, PYD, YPG, or the self-administration or the SDC, if those basic conditions are not met, yes, we're going to continue to see not a move towards interim uh, stabilization, we're going to see continuing uncertainty and insecurity. Uh, uh, and of course, let's not forget the role here being played by the regime, by Iranian militias as well, as well as Daesh. Um, so it's, it's both a local problem, it's a regional problem, it's a geopolitical problem. 
Thank you very much. Now let me move on to Amar. Amar, what is your view of uh, the U.S. support? I mean, continuous support to PYD and YPG. What are the main expectations of U.S. and the motivations, given the fact that ISIS is no longer there as power as they were in in, in the beginning? Because the main uh, purpose of uh, giving support to PYD and YPG was that they were fighting against Daesh, uh, but that was the legitimate uh, the ground for the legitimacy of this, let's say, a support, but it is no longer there. I mean, how do you think that will uh, uh, unfold in the future? I mean, how, how will it unfold? And unfortunately, doesn't so far, there, there doesn't look to be a, a path for uh, a new governance structure in uh, northeast Syria. Uh, whether Daesh, uh, ISIS still continues, I, ISIS still is a spoiler to in, in all regions, actually, in Syria. And that's uh, something that continues to pose a threat to stability and a, post, uh, and a threat to uh, the ceasefire. Uh, I, I think one of the first steps that needs to be to, to for the U.S. Uh, actually to is is uh, to enforce a ceasefire, to, in, to enforce a cease of hostilities. That those uh, attacks in uh, Afrin, in Azaz, in Al Bab need to stop. Uh, you know, I was there several times during these. Uh, you know, luckily before or right after uh, uh, one of those bombs blow up, uh, and I've spoken to a lot of uh, military personnel that have caught hundreds, if not thousands, of cases of. Uh, explosives coming specifically from, uh, you know, the Wrath of, of Olives uh, group, which is a, a PYD affiliate, uh, with a website that claims responsibility on every market attack and every school attack and so forth. It's it's a it's a horrible situation that really people don't on the ground would not accept uh, a, a an agreement with uh, uh, the PYD or the SDC or SDF or or, or regardless of the the title until those hostilities are stopped. Uh, and then the, comes the question of good governance and, and uh, representation, participatory uh, structures where, uh, unfortunately, again, throughout the Kurdish-Kurdish dialogues that have taken place since, uh, you know, since 2012 uh, in Huleyr, in, in Arbil, uh, and, and until now, uh, it's consistently a... Uh, a, a very totalitarian approach to to the Kurdish Kurdish dialogues, where uh, the the PYD established a consortium of, of political parties, uh, just like the uh, Ba'ath Party front of uh, political uh, parties, so-called political parties in Damascus. Uh, they established like a, a consortium of political aff affiliated uh, uh, political parties and uh, trying to negotiate with the Kurdish uh, National Council as a group. Uh, rather, you know, to, to present themselves to, to, to be perceived as a group. And so far, so far the, the U.S. has not been able to achieve uh, a pressure uh, on, on uh, a, a serious Kurdish-Kurdish dialogue, let alone the other components in the region. I mean, the, uh, in Deir Zor, the situation is very tense. Uh, in Raqqa, uh, continues, and we have researchers actually on the ground uh, from the, both of those areas, and uh, including Qamishli. And so... It's it's a very uh, difficult condition. Uh, let alone, I think what I, what we're concerned as as a think tank is is the communal uh, conflicts are not the the politicians or the armed groups, uh, but but the communal divisions that are that are very. Uh, I, I mean, those leave a long impact on the region uh, and the entire region. This creates a vital uh, ground for the. Uh, resurgence of uh, of terrorist groups. This creates a, a ground for many uh, instabilities in the region. And so, what should the United States do is is to enforce first of all a a serious cease of hostilities, and then establish a mechanism where uh, Turkey is engaged, where all parties are engaged, to establish something of a a, a more uh, at least an interim, like Salman mentioned, until. Uh, the, the situation in the political process, you know, uh, opens up. Uh, so far, it seems that the, the, the uh, different parties uh, or armies on the ground uh, do not have an agreement yet. Uh, the U.S. is still uh, busy uh, trying to, uh, you know, reshuffle uh, and clean up house uh, and so and, and reestablish, you know, American diplomacy and so forth. Uh, and so, and so th there's, there's a lot of things that need to be done immediately. And more in the interim uh, period, in terms of establishing, uh, you know, economic trade uh, agreements uh, across borders, uh, where civilians can cross, where at least uh, civil society groups can can function, where uh, 
uh, uh, men, you know, will not be drafted and, and forced into conscription uh, within the, you know, the SDF or PYD or uh, men and, and, and girls even uh, that continue to be pulled uh, under 18 to be pulled into conscription or over 18. I mean, this is one of the blessings in the North and the Northwest in opposition areas is you don't get uh, pulled. In fact, it's the way opposite. You can easily leave armed groups and, and uh, you know, fair of, and, and a lot of incentives are to leave armed groups uh, in terms of the pay that the National uh, Army in the North uh, pays and move to humanitarian, to business uh, sectors and so forth. So I, I, I think, I mean, I, I can talk a lot about it, but, you know, PYD is a, is a totalitarian one that refused in the past to negotiate with uh, the Kurdish communities. We've just, we have an upcoming study that is coming up this month on the judicial system in the Northeast. I mean, out of a... Uh, 326 uh, judges that uh, are appointed in the civilian courts in the PYD or SDC administration. Only one is an actual judge, uh, meaning he served as a as a as a judge before the crisis. Uh, and 65% are Kurds, uh, less than 30 are Arabs, and 5% are uh, from other uh, minorities. Uh, if you go into the uh, uh, the higher courts, the more terrorist uh, terrorism courts. 100% Kurdish, and let alone, I mean, we, we've interviewed over 60 judges in those courts. Um, in, in the terrorism uh, court that tries the ISIS groups, for example, uh, and tries, uh, takes also Kurdish, uh, uh, Kurdish National Council members under the claim of terrorist uh, and exceptional courts, uh, which, which goes obviously in, in, uh, in, in uh, conflict with their own uh, social pact in the Northeast. Uh, we have 100% Kurdish uh, and 100% uh, Turkish Kurdish and 100% Turkish or Iranian uh, Kurdish uh, members, cadre members that govern those uh, uh, courts, not even Syrian uh, PYD members. So that that's how, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, authoritarian uh, structure that is non, it's not based on decentralization, it's not based on a bottom-up approach. But it's a, it's a very top-down approach in terms of the judiciary, in terms of the the governance. And again, we you know I'm I'm speaking out of uh, several studies, one of which is is coming forth uh, very soon. Uh, so, so the U.S. really needs to step in to establish at least stability. And stability means uh, it needs to use a carrot and a stick, or maybe a stick at the beginning until you you have some carrot to 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 make them into uh, political actors. Currently, they're not acting as uh, ones that are even interested in a, uh, a cease of hostilities. But Dr. Talib, can I can I say just a little bit more on the Americans here? Sure. Uh, I I was I guess fortunate enough at the time of the uh, transition from uh, Trump to President Biden to actually be in Washington, and uh, even though there were COVID restrictions, I was lucky enough uh, to spend a, quite a bit of time with. Uh, uh, Bastard Brownstein, who is in the northeast of Syria, he's, I guess, the top American civilian diplomat um, in the area uh, right now. Um, whilst it's still early days, I'm, I do believe, um, and I think certainly the Biden administration has to um, uh, uh, walk the, the talk as such in, in that it believes in diplomacy, but I think it has to further increase its diplomatic efforts here. Uh, but certainly what I heard from Ambassador Brownstein, and I think uh, even subsequent to him arriving, has been a greater effort, I believe, to not just to talk to uh, the, the Kurdish entities uh, which are uh, effectively administering the area, but to get further around and to uh, speak to those in the Arab communities. It's very early days as such. Um, but uh, it does give me uh, some cause to at least to encourage that uh, process of engagement uh, much more which brownstein uh, seems to be doing and and to be doing it uh, uh, critically uh, by himself not necessarily being escorted um, all the time uh, in in that uh, regard but there are far too many american diplomats on the ground doing this kind of work so that needs to be increased secondly uh, that dialogue with turkey with ankara between washington and ankara has to not just uh, continue, but it has to deepen. Um, I think Ambassador Jim Jeffrey understood that, um, uh, and 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 so did uh, uh, his other colleagues. Uh, and going forward, uh, 
there must not be a pause in that. Um, in fact, I do believe that when it comes to Syria, despite the obvious differences when it comes to the northeast of Syria, uh, the United States and Turkey can find a win-win uh, opportunity uh, and find a way actually, again, when it comes to Syria, uh, to work together more intensively, particularly in terms of reviving uh, uh, the, the political process and uh, moving towards, I think, a goal that they both would have, which is for there to be a serious uh, political transition. Um, in, in the country, uh, which produces the, the kind of stability that, uh, and the whole of Syria that, uh, that one is looking for. Salman, in the beginning, you have uh, indicated that the real price is paid by the Syrian people on the ground. When you look at the IDP and the displacement of people, almost half of the population has been displaced. One third, you know, now is IDP. The rest uh, are in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, given, you know, this is also part of the fragmentation uh, that uh, maybe that these people maybe do not have arms, but you know, sociologically there is such dispersion. And how do you see the future? I mean, um, that's a very difficult question. But um, as far as I can see, there is no ownership of the refugee or you know, asylum, immigration, whatever you call it, problem at the moment. Turkey does own the, you know, some part of it, actually, a great part of it, let's say, but when it comes to Europe or other Gulf states, regional actors, sure. they seem to be uh, turning away from the crisis. And uh, this will have yeah. a huge, uh, I think, implications. No, absolutely right. Um, well, of course, Turkey has taken on the biggest burden and it uh, continues to do so. Um, and I and uh, I, I think it will do so uh, going forward. But of course, there is the role of other uh, neighboring countries as well, and we see the difficulties that uh, refugees are having in, in their own sets of crises which are taking place, for example, in Lebanon um, um, as well. Um, uh, what concerns me, uh, uh, though I believe there, when it comes to neighboring support, I, I guess Europe, will seek uh, to continue to provide the kind of uh, aid and support and maybe we will see some more renewed commitment to that. But, but what concerns me more uh, going forward is, uh, is, is the environment in Europe um, itself. Um, uh, uh, we are at a very critical moment when it comes to Europe. A lot is said, and here I'm British, I, I believe in European values as well as... Uh, but I must say, uh, more recently, I have been quite embarrassed uh, by the whole issue of how refugees and political asylum seekers uh, uh, have been uh, received in particular uh, 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 European countries. And these are not just the countries of Eastern Europe, um, uh, as has often been uh, uh, made the case. Uh, in, my, in my own country, in the UK, though not specifically applying to Syrian refugees, when it comes to political asylum seekers, there seems to be uh, different rules and different ideas which are out there, which I think uh, do not go either with the letter or spirit of international law and uh, refugee law. Secondly, um, of all places, uh, Denmark. Uh, le let me be very clear here. What the Danish Prime Minister and the Social Democrats are doing is neither social democracy as I know it, um, and I'm a social democrat, and it is not European values. Um, as we know them, um, either to uh, to seek to dissuade, to pressure political asylum seekers who, who may not be given political asylum to leave the country is illegal. It's an embarrassment to Europe. And I think, uh, I hope that uh, other European leaders uh, will speak up much more than has been the case. And, and again, this is Denmark. And I, I hope the Danish people um, themselves, and we know there are many groups uh, uh, and, and many individuals and citizens who are not uh, impressed with this. Um, and again, it is the Syrian people um, who are at the uh, uh, at the end of of such a, uh, uh, behavior. Um, more encouragingly, we are seeing that the Biden administration is seeking to increase uh, the number. Of, of Syrian uh, refugees and other political asylum seekers, though from a very low base that the Trump administration had reduced this to. Um, I hope that that uh, 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 trend will continue because we know, as I'm sure Turkey has seen, uh, 
that uh, Syrians are are industrious people. They they will establish themselves and they will be a great asset uh, to those societies until and when they can go back. It is not safe for them to go back to uh, areas such as Damascus. And I can vouch for that directly with some of the Syrians that we sp still speak to are in particularly in regime held areas, who uh, some of whom disappear for large amounts of time and come under a lot of pressure for any kind of, uh, of, of uh, activism um, uh, that they may show or even criticism that they may well make um, of, of the regime. So yes, this is a, a, a serious problem. Uh, I don't have any clear answers other than to, for us all to use our voice. Um, and uh, I believe I've done that right now. Uh, thank you, Salman. Now, similar question to you, Ammar. Can you please uh, compare the uh, situation of Syrians in Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan? Because I think you've been to uh, different countries and you live in Turkey. How do you see, uh, you know, their their reception, their um, involvement in society and uh, uh, the services that they get from the public uh, uh, administrations. Uh, and also the second part of my question, to what extent they can contribute to the peace efforts in the country or to mobilize or uh, lobby the uh, countries in which they live, including those in Europe as well, not only in the neighboring countries. Is there any chance that uh, they can also contribute to the peace efforts and uh, probably a establishment of some sort of stability in Syria? Well, I mean, it's, it's very different between neighboring countries and uh, Syrian diaspora that has been uh, more established in the U.S. and not, not all of Europe, but just some of European countries like France, for example, that has a, a diaspora community. Uh, other communities that uh, came as asylum seekers or refugees in uh, Germany and Sweden and others are still very new and have not yet uh, integrated well. I mean, we still we have a few here and there in Germany and, and others that have, uh, you know, went into public office uh, or in the, I think even in the UK recently. Uh, but but uh, those are, are very small uh, in numbers. I think uh, in terms of neighboring countries, uh, to, to become to lobby those governments, it's very difficult because a lot of them are yet still, uh, after nine years, establishing uh, um, you know their livelihoods, their businesses, and so forth. In uh, Turkey, uh, Syrians have established uh, over six thousand businesses that are registered and uh, have accumulated at least thirty billion, uh, I think, dollars of, of capital in in those businesses, according to uh, some of the reports uh, published here. There's 3.6 million uh, uh, under the uh, protection uh, status and a few hundred thousand uh, that are under regular uh, uh, permits. In, in Turkey, uh, the process is uh, is still, I mean, it's it's relatively one of the, the most, I mean, by far, of course, uh, the highest in terms of support that has been given to uh, Syrian refugees in terms of public health uh, institutions education uh, and, and other public services. Uh, there are no uh, camps, for example. I think most of the camps in Turkey have been uh, shut down and Syrians have moved into cities and villages and towns and registered and uh, basically started to integrate into communities, uh, you know, Turkish lessons. And I haven't learned my Turkish yet uh, myself, but I think a lot of Syrians have uh, relatively, I think the last, uh, study of, of Syrians, for example, in Germany, only 30% have, have gone into, uh, have learned the language of, of the country and still 65% uh, have not learned the language and have not integrated into the job market even. Uh, in uh, Turkey, for example, we have, as part of a Syrian foreign consortium, an organization that helps Syrians integrate into the job market. So we've helped uh, close to 22,000 Syrians uh, integrate into the job market. Now, I, I think compared to that, the other extreme of, of those services is the case in Lebanon. Uh, the case in Lebanon, I think it's a very problematic one, both in terms of humanitarian, which is very uh, uh, problematic to say the least, uh, if not very disastrous, uh, especially during winter, but even politically, even in terms of rights. And, and, and I've been to uh, some villages that say Syrians not welcome uh, in, in Lebanon. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and, and some shops and, and so forth. I've seen them myself. So I, I, I uh, you know, those, those are very problematic in terms of uh, 
the political process or lobbying, forget about it in Lebanon uh, completely. I think even in terms of uh, participation in elections, Hezbollah has played in the last election a uh, you know a bullying force in terms of pushing Syrians that uh, you know, for example, rent or neighbors and or in camps to go and actually vote for Bashar al-Assad in the last election. So that I, I see as a very problematic uh, situation. Jordan is somewhere in the middle, where uh, yes, it has issued some work permits, uh, for example, for at least three hundred thousand plus uh, Syrians in the job market. Uh, and and have have given up also space for Syrian business communities, um, but Jordan generally is a very uh, is not very wealthy and not well off, and and also dependent on international aid. Uh, Syrians in in Jordan have perhaps a good chance of of going back uh, into uh, Syria if the conditions, but none of them have gone back. I mean, with all the opening of the border with Syria and the Russians' propaganda of you know, return. Uh, I think the numbers, I, I can't remember the last, the last number I've read was about 30,000 from a Russian expert uh, that uh, those have actually went back and stayed back because a lot of them have gone back and forth or have, uh, you know, needed uh, to to bring their family in and they go back and forth and so forth. Uh, and, and so the that, the, those are the conditions in the neighboring countries. There's also about 200,000 in uh, Iraq, uh, in Erbil, in Kurdistan, Iraq, uh, that also have, uh, you know, difficult conditions to say the least, that uh, are not are not on the dashboard of attention of uh, international or even Syrian organizations. Unfortunately, I've also been uh, to Erbil and visited some of those communities. Uh, the communities in Egypt are continue to be more or less more into the business community also. Uh, in in Europe, uh, or let's say in the U.S., since I'm also familiar with that, I think uh, Syrian communities have organized themselves pretty well, uh, both in terms of political lobbies and PACs uh, and so forth, but also in terms of uh, organizing uh, the Syrian voice and the human rights voice uh, with uh, with a lot of other communities. Also, for example, the Caesar Act was was a result of uh, very serious uh, hard work of Syrian American communities. Um, also, there's the you know the uh, uh, American Relief Coalition for Syria in in, in DC that joins uh, a group of of Syrian American uh, NGOs, humanitarian NGOs that have a, a a strong lobby as they brought bring in a lot of uh, dollars in actually, uh, and 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 have brought in at least ten billion dollars in the last few years, uh, and, and those have have also put some humanitarian effort on the cross border discussions going on in DC and New York. Uh, and and hopefully those you know have I think in the U.S. is a different uh, situation because Syrian Americans have been there since the 60s or or even before, uh, and that is is a good example of how Syrian Americans have organized well. Well, thank you. I think that also uh, indicates that there is uh, a lot of potential there. And uh, let's have the concluding remarks from Salman over the uh, involvement of uh, Syrians in the peace process, whether. The, such a thing is possible and how? Well, uh, Talib, you just said it. Uh, I think there is a, a lot of potential and let me try and uh, end on a, on a more uh, optimistic note. Um, when we started our own work in bringing Syrians together in dialogues 10 years ago, uh, you know, we, we were able to focus as we were advised on a broad cross section of Syrian society. Well. That society of professionals, of practitioners, of civil society has matured um, over the over the years, and so I think there is a, a huge amount of talent uh, of of Syrians uh, in what will be a very difficult transition from war to peace. We know that so it takes uh, almost decades, and I mean Amar's work and the, his center's work is just a, one example of that. The role of Syrian women. Uh, and let me just say this very clearly, and the contributions that they make every day um, is, is one that we should uh, never uh, uh, forget. The, the, the challenge is, and this is the challenge for the international community, is how do we harness that uh, seriously in, the serious, in a serious political process where the regime does not continue to have a veto after 10 years on any serious political negotiations and political discussion. The UN tried to do that a few years ago by bringing in civil society groups and and by bringing in Syrian women. But that, I think, is just very embryonic. Uh, we need to find ways uh, in which to, even if it's not done at the highest table, 
whereby which we can see the, the real results of that Syrian ingenuity and that Syrian um, intelligence um, going forward. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Salman Sheikh, founder and CEO of the Sheikh Group, and Ammar Kaf, executive director of Omran Center for Strategic Studies and member of the Syrian Forum. I just would like to thank you on behalf of the TRT World Forum Digital Debates, gentlemen. Hope to see you again, and I would like to say goodbye to everyone who watched us today. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.